But that's not what defines us. What defines us is how we react to these setbacks and struggles. And our friend, as Angie said, stuntman Stu is fighting the struggle and the challenge of his life right now. And the way that he's responded to it, it inspires me and I'm sure it inspires us all. So I'm gonna dedicate this story to him tonight. The story starts in 1985 when none of you, well some of you weren't even born, Angie. <laughs> Others were learning to walk and as a matter of fact, Jim Watson was perfecting his moonwalk. For me, I was a 15 year old boy and on January 22nd of that year, me and my big brother Bill were sitting down on my mom's green couch to watch the biggest football game on the planet, the Super Bowl. We were watching it on a, on a TV that kind of would pass for the size of an iPad nowadays, about a little 14-incher, but we were happy because it was color. And we had the only color TV on the block. We were sitting there, big bowl of popcorn, and we're watching the Super Bowl. In that game was a guy by the name of Dan Marino, number 13 for the Miami Dolphins. Halfway through the game, my big brother Bill turns to me and he goes, you know what, Mark? Dan Marino is making and breaking all kinds of records this year, and he's taking this team to the biggest game on the planet. He says to me, Mark, if Dan Marino can do so much at such a young, early age, surely someday you could play in the NFL. And I was like, what? This kid from Ottawa is going to play in the NFL? I'd only played one year of organized football up until this point at a school right here in Ottawa called Gloucester High School. Raise your hand if you went to Gloucester High School. You, yeah, right there. It's good to see you're out of prison now, Dave. That's good. That's very good. It's a tough school. It was a very tough school. Okay, I remember my first day of grade nine. It's like there's other adults walking around with books, but there were really students. And at the end of that day, my big brother Bill says to me, Mark, Gloucester High School has a tackle football team. Why don't you go try out for the team? You love football. He's like, all right, Bill, that sounds cool. So I go through my first day of grade nine, end of the day. Okay, I go out to tryouts. I never had the pads on before. Chris Neal, remember when you put your first uh, pair of shoulder pads on hockey equipment? Backwards, upside down. That's how it was. I had no idea how to do it. Figure it all out. I go out to practice. I go out to try out, trying out as a receiver. Very first play. I'm running down the field, and they throw me the ball. And you know when you do something the first time, and you do it so well, that everybody goes, whoa, that kid's a natural. You know that? Didn't happen. <laughs> I got smoked so hard. I was lying on my back, vision's all blurry. Big dude who hit me, Eric Cedarberg. He walks over, looks down at me. He's like, uh, you all right, little buddy? And I look up at this guy, and he's got a beard. <laughs> he's one guy in high school that's already got the beard, man. Scary looking dude. He's got like a bandana on and earrings and everything. And I just jumped up, and I ran home to Bill. And I said, Bill, man, maybe this football is just too hard for me. And I think there's a pirate on the team. <laughs> And he says, if it was easy, it would not be worth doing. You get back out there, and you keep trying. And I did. I went back the very next day. Guys, in my first year of organized football at Gloucester High School, you can clap, because we had a perfect season. We perfectly lost every game. We were terrible. And here it is three months later. We're on the green couch watching the Super Bowl. And my big brother Bill's telling me that someday I'm going to make it to the NFL. How am I going to do that, Bill? He goes, well, I got an idea. You go out to practice in the games with your teammates to get better. Let's go down to the local sports field when nobody else is working. And let's work hard in the cold and the rain and the dark. And we did it. We hung out together and we loved doing it. And we got better. And we loved doing it. So we worked. We did it all nine months of the offseason. Second season starts. I get into a game, I start catching footballs, and I start scoring touchdowns, and we start winning football games. And at the end of that season, my big brother says to me, Mark, this is a special year. You're gonna make it to the playoffs. And for those of you from Toronto, the playoffs are another season that happens after your season is done. Thank you. Thank you, applause break during salad is a big deal. Thank you very much. 
So I got a playoff game. I got a playoff game. I'll never forget my first big game, October 30th, 1985, my first playoff game. Okay, I was down in my stance, ready for opening kickoff. I could see the fans, hear the cheerleaders, smell the guy making hot dogs. Smell the hot dogs the guy was making. Probably sounds better. I used to look over at the stands and wave at my brother. He wasn't there that particular moment, but I'd catch up with him later. He was probably getting some hot dogs or something. They kicked the ball off to us. We march it down the field on the very first drive, and we scored. You could clap. Yeah. Yeah. Your husband is handsome, Angie, by the way. He's, he's dreamy. It's the first time I've seen him. <laughs> <laughs> we kick the ball off to them, they march it down the field, and they scored. And it happened like that all game long. We battled hard, we fought tooth and nail, first half, second half. And my first big game, we lost. Yeah, right, thank you. We lost. And as a young person, I'd never experienced that kind of loss before. And I didn't know how to handle that situation. So I walk back into the change room, and I, I get to my spot, and I sit down. And as I sit down, somebody from across the room yells. And they go, Mark, your Uncle Chuck is out in the hallway. You have to go talk to him right now. And I hadn't seen my uncle in months. And he, he never came to any of my sports stuff before. So it was kind of weird. And I walk out in the hallway, and he's standing there. And I got half my football equipment on. And his eyes are all red. And he walks over to me, and he takes me by the arm. And he says, Mark, I'm sorry, but your big brother Bill died today. You see, my brother was born with a hole in his heart. And from a very young age, he was told by the doctors that any day could be his last day. But he never let that get in his way. He took every day, and he lived it like it might be his last and on that day, October 30th, 1985, I made a promise to my brother, a promise I could never take back, that the goal, the dream of me playing in the NFL, I would never stop trying to achieve it until I did it, until there was nowhere left to keep trying. Faced with that obstacle, I easily could have given up and quit. Everybody would have expected it of me. But I wasn't going to let the legacy of my older brother's life be of his little brother quitting on things. I was going to let the legacy of his life of his little brother never giving up on things. So I took myself out to that sports field in the cold, in the rain, in the dark. And every year of high school football, I got a little bit better. And by my last season of high school football at Gloucester High School, when other guys in the team are getting letters from colleges and universities saying they want them to go there and play football, every day I check my mailbox for one of those letters. And I never got one. But I didn't give up. I'd made a promise. I went back to high school another year when all my friends had left, and I worked at my grades, and I got those up, and I worked at my football, and I got better at that. And I got one letter from the smallest football playing school in Canada. Great school, Bishop's University. Thank you very much. Yes. Gators. <laughs> Nobody from that school had ever gone on to play in the NFL. Not even Chad Shella, believe it or not. <laughs> I was told it's impossible. It's too small a school. If you go there, no one's going to hear about you. But it was my only hope. And it was my only chance. And I knew if I went there and I was going to do something that nobody in the history of that school had ever done before, then I was going to have to make an impact from the day I got there. I was going to have to impress not only my coaches, but all the coaches in that league. And they would have to vote me as an all-star early and often. And that was my plan. Three weeks before my first training camp at Bishop's University, I was working in a warehouse in Orleans trying to raise the money to pay to go to school. And I cut the tip off my finger. That's not good for a receiver, right? So I bandaged it up. I'm going anyways. Okay, my van is packed. I'm ready to head out. My buddies show up, and they go, hey, before you leave Hatfield, let's play a little basketball. Great idea. I broke my ankle. Horrible idea. <laughs> I show up at my first training camp with a big cast over here and a bandage over here. And did I win an all-star award that year? No. I didn't even play in a football game that year. But I didn't give up. I kept working all off season. I'd made that promise. So I, kept, I get into my second season. I get into my first game. Let's have a clap because I scored a touchdown in my first game. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
After the game, the coach tells me I'm moving to defense. Chris Neal, imagine if the coach told you you're going to become a defenseman. What would you do? It was horrible. <laughs> and then a goalie the next week. They moved me to offensive line. I have no idea. My, my dream, my goal is spiraling out of control, but I don't give up. My third season, still haven't won an all-star award. I arrive at training camp. Head coach Ian Breck says, today we're going to have a strength test. Puts 400 pounds on the bar. Wants to see how many times you can bench press it. The year before, I did it two times, and I knew I'd beat that. I could, I'd been working hard in the weight room. So there I was lying on my back, big, big heavy bar across my throat. What could go wrong? <laughs> Foreshadowing. There we go. And my friends, my friends were standing around clapping for me, get ready to cheer. So here we'll clap just a little bit, just a little bit. I get to one. They start clapping more because I got to two. I've tied what I did the year before, and I still got strength. I get to three. They clap even more. I can see you not clapping. They get to three. I beat with, I get to four. I've doubled what I did the year before. I go to put the weight down. High five my buddy. Forget to move my hand. Drop the weight on my hand. Break my hand in three places. <laughs> and what do you do immediately when, when, when you hurt yourself? I called my mom. <laughs> and I said, Mom, I broke my hand in three places. And she says, stop going to those places. <laughs> I played the whole season with one hand. Did I win an all-star award that year? No, I did not. <laughs> I got one year left. I give it all I got. I didn't win an all-star award that year either. I go back for the victory lap, the fifth year. That year, let's clap, clap it out, because I got an all-star award that year. <laughs> right, Chad Shell in 1994, all-star award. <laughs> we won the OQIFC, Bishops University. Yeah, right on. <laughs> so I finally achieved it. I've got that piece of paper. Now, what does the outside world think about that? Well, the CFL, first round of the Canadian College Draft. BC Lions think a lot of it. First round, they draft Mark Hatfield. Pretty good for my social life, right? <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter. Come on now. <laughs> but was that my goal? Was that my dream? No, I wanted to play in the NFL. I promised my brother I'd do everything I could to get to the NFL. And what did the NFL think of that one all-star award from the smallest football playing school in Canada? Nothing. Yeah, who's going to care about you? They didn't care. So I had to do more. And I made a videotape, and I sent it to every football team in the NFL, and then I waited, and then you know what happened? Nothing, because you wait forever, right? I picked up the phone, I call, started calling them, they would hang up, I called back, I, they would hang up, I called back a third day, guess what I got the third day? Restraining order? <laughs> Didn't work either. I had to get an expert. I got a sports agent. He started calling NFL football teams for me. And one month to go before the NFL training camp started that year, I got a phone call from the NFL's Detroit Lions inviting me to training camp. Yeah, 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 you were going to clap. You could clap at any time. It was, is the entree here? What happened? I got one month to go. One month to go. Time to rest and relax before camp? No, pedal to the metal. Here's where it gets excited. I signed up in a place in Ann Arbor, Michigan called Dr. Ping's House of Pain, where NFL football players go and do martial arts against each other until they bruise and they bleed. They lift weights until they throw up. They run sprints until they weep openly. I left there. I felt like Superman. If I get hit by a truck, the truck would break to pieces. I get to training camp in Detroit. I dominated every drill of every practice. I played every snap of every preseason game. They announced the final roster, and I got cut. I got cut. I know. Coach walks in the room, looks at me, and he goes, oh, Hatfield, still here. You can go home. I can go home. I just left university. I had no home. I had to come back to Ottawa and live on my mom's now very old green couch. I hated that couch. I shared that couch with a wiener dog named Fritzy. I hated Fritzy. Don't judge me. You can find your motivation anywhere. I wandered away from that Dachshund, so I kept working out. Three days later, I get back to my couch and my Dachshund. Big finish coming up here, guys. I get back to my Dachshund and my couch, and there's a message on my answering machine. And this time, it's from the Miami Dolphins. Wow. And it says, yeah, okay. Wow. <laughs> and I pressed it. Beep. It says, Mark Hatfield. 
It's, uh, we've been watching you since day one in Detroit. And under other circumstances, that would be a pretty creepy message to get. <laughs> but this is exciting in the circumstance. It says, we've been watching you since day one in Detroit. We want you to fly down here, do a workout, maybe be on the team. I'm on the next airplane. The date is October 30th, wow. 1995. It was 10 years to the day that my big brother Bill died. It was 10 years to the day that I made that promise. I'll let you guys take that fact home with you and decide what it means to you. I know what it means to me. But what I will tell you is it took 10 years. It took 10 years of failure. It took 10 years of people telling me I couldn't do it. It took 10 years of waking up every single day and pointing myself in that direction. I go out. I do my workout, I lay it on the line, not afraid of mistakes, give it everything I got. Workout's done, head coach Don Shula goes, great job Hatfield, why don't you go inside, sit down, somebody will be in to talk to you in a moment. I go inside, I sit down, it's a big empty room, still trying to catch my breath, all sweaty, and dirty from the workout. Door at the back of the room opens up. This familiar looking guy walks in the room. He walks right straight over to me, he goes, hi Mark. I'm Dan Marino. Congratulations, you made the team that day. That day my dream came true. Yours can too. Find something you love doing. Make sure it's legal, okay? Eyes on you. Next time you're faced with a roadblock, I want you guys to stop, take a minute, <coughs> take a step back and take another look. Because that roadblock, that roadblock might just be your stepping stone. Thank you very much.